Good afternoon or morning or evening or whenever you're joining us and welcome to interview with the experts coming to you from Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. My name is Kyle Clarich and I'm one of the cardiologists here and I have the great pleasure of being joined by Dr. Robert France, who is the director of the Pulmonary Hypertension Clinic in Mayo Clinic. He is a professor of medicine in the College of Medicine at Mayo Clinic, and he also practices out of the Rochester campus. He is an expert in the treatment of, uh, as you know, pulmonary hypertension, but also in heart failure, ventricular cyst devices, and cardiac catheterization, and has been really instrumental in advancing the field of pulmonary hypertension therapies. Uh, I would like to ask Dr. France to talk to us today about latest developments in the treatment of chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Bob, welcome. Thanks so much, Kyle. It's terrific to be here, and I'm excited to visit with all of you about this, this field that continues to evolve. You know, we, we think about pulmonary emboli that most of the time, if you make the diagnosis in a timely way and anticoagulate patients, they're, they're going to be okay, that like 90 plus percent will resolve the clots and, and the pulmonary vasculature that will go back to where it was. But in somewhere between 2 and 8% of patients who have pulmonary emboli, some of those clots, instead of dissolving with anticoagulation, organize and create webs and bands and obstructions in the pulmonary vasculature. And if you obstruct enough of that cross-sectional area, then the only way the blood can get from the right side of the heart to the left side is going to be at a higher pressure because of the increased resistance of the pulmonary vasculature. And so this ability to deal with chronic clots in the lungs has evolved from one where the real only option was to do open surgical endarterectomy, which remains the procedure of choice for patients with extensive thromboembolic disease, but a very subspecialized procedure that requires cardiopulmonary bypass and deep circulatory arrest under cold kind of cooling to protect the brain and shelling out this material and rewarming. And we have teams here that are very good at doing that operation, and so we're fortunate that way. But over the recent years, there's been increasing uh, consideration of balloon pulmonary angioplasty. You know so well about putting in coronary artery balloons and stents, but this can also be performed in the pulmonary vasculature where you put a wire across a narrowing, put a balloon across it, inflate that balloon, and take away some of that narrowing to restore flow to that obstructed segment of the pulmonary vasculature. And an interesting thing about the pulmonary arterial vasculature is that it doesn't tend to restenose. The physiology of the endothelial lining is just different. And so as opposed to coronary work where you really need a stent or you're going to have a high risk of restenosis, most of these pulmonary arterioles that you open up with a, a balloon are going to stay open once you've opened them, which is great. Um, so this is something that's evolved over the last decade where initially was quite risky, where there was substantial risk of intrapulmonary hemorrhage and serious complications, to now to a point where it's a, a remarkably safe and effective technique for restoring flow to segments of the lung and allowing a reduction in the pulmonary pressure and improving shortness of breath and right heart function in patients with chronic thromboembolic pH. So we have a couple of terrific interventionalists here, Dr. Guri Sandhu and Dr. Trevor Samard, who are just really, really experts at finding their way across these narrowings and cautiously dilating them and opening them up. And so this ability to restore flow to these segments is, is a wonderful therapy that we're using frequently in our patients with chronic thromboembolic pH. So Bob, let me just be clear. I, you know, when we first started talking about this, I just thought heard angioplasty and no stint. And I was that actually surprised me a little bit that we don't need a stint. Is that pretty much universal or are there sub subsets of patients that might need a stint or not not necessarily? No, you know, it's 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 really remarkable that it that they, these vessels very rarely recoil or renarrow. Now there are subsets of other forms of pulmonary arterial obstruction 
Like we also see in the Mississippi River, River Valley fibrosing mediastinitis, where there's basically an inflammatory reaction to histo or blastomycosis kind of fungal infections. And that, that process causes scarring in the mediastinum and narrowing of pulmonary arteries by external compression or pulmonary veins. And, and we do have experts here who are quite facile at getting across those narrowings but those do require a stent because of external compression and you have to prop it open. So there are situations where, where a pulmonary artery stent might be needed or even a pulmonary vein stent, you know, in somebody who may have venous involvement, which is a transeptal and all the complexity of that. But in chronic thromboembolic pH, uh, it's very, very unusual that you would need a stent. It's just balloons take everything out and the vessel stays open. Wow, that's that's really remarkable, and what a great thing, you know, not to have to put the stint in, you know, just for all the other potential possibilities with that. Yeah. So you've also, you've offered us two uh, therapies for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension: the tri tried and true surgical intervention, which takes a very subspecialized team uh, in a surgical center of expertise around this and probably a fairly long time in the OR, from my experience. Um, and then you've got new therapies available with the, uh, with the balloon angioplasty. How do you make that patient selection? Right, and, and even to add one more complexity to it, we also have medications. And so uh, there's this drug called Reosiguat, which is a soluble gonolate cyclase stimulator and the interesting thing about chronic thromboembolic pH is that there is obstruction of the vasculature, but that elevation and pressure and other factors is also associated with pulmonary arterial vasoconstriction. So it's interesting, if you give these patients some nitric oxide in the cath lab, the pulmonary vascular resistance will come down at least some. And so there's also this drug called Riosigwat that has been studied and shown to improve six minute walk distance in patients with, with inoperable or residual chronic thromboembolic pH after endarterectomy that by relaxing the pulmonary vasculature brings down the PA pressure, improves shortness of breath and six minute walk distance. So we have open surgery, we have balloons and we have a drug. And so we're now thinking about three different things. Now, an interesting thing about that is that a randomized trial was done of balloons versus medication, and the balloons won in terms of better effect on pulmonary vascular resistance and overall greater efficacy. But an interesting thing was that the patients who had been treated with the drug first had lower complications of the balloon work, maybe oh. by virtue of bringing down the pressure sum and reducing risk of reperfusion injury when you put up a balloon and suddenly increase flow into that segment. So for, for first of all, if we think that patients are surgical candidates for open endarterectomy, we recommend that because that's a very good procedure if you have surgeons really expert in doing it take that material out and really drastically bring down the pulmonary pressure. Either in patients where there's just too much distal disease or they're not good surgical candidates or sometimes they just refuse, say, I don't, I don't want surgery, we would tend to do balloon work, but usually would treat them with Riosiguat for a few months first in order to bring down the PA pressure and resistance that seems to reduce the risk of complications of the balloon work. And then maybe afterwards we come off the Riosiguat or maybe we stay on it long term. So we have that third option. So essentially, we have a multidisciplinary team that will review the imaging, the, the ventilation perfusion, lung scans, the CT scans, the pulmonary angiograms, the hemodynamics, the echoes, and work together to form a treatment plan where we don't have a vested interest in anything, right? We got balloons, we got surgeons that can do the work, we've got medication, and as a team, we're just gonna do what's best for the patient. And, and it makes it really fun to be part of that team where you can say, okay, we need you for this, but we need you for that. And, and it's just a, a really, really gratifying practice um, that we go through in, in a multidisciplinary fashion as we learned in so many fields is really the best way to practice medicine. Wow, that's fantastic. And again, congratulations for having all these options that we've developed over the years within our pulmonary hypertension expertise. So I'm going to say I have a patient that comes to me in general cardiology clinic and has pulmonary hypertension. And they've had a history of a 
of a pulmonary embolism, what would be my next test to get to sort of say, do I need to refer this patient to the pulmonary hypertension clinic to be considered for one of these therapies? How do I, how do I, or do I just send them to you and you go through your workup? <laughs> yeah, well, we often collaborate with referring providers on this and have them do some of the testing locally and see what they find and send the patients who really need us. But I mean, for chronic thromboembolic pH, the best test to look for it really is a ventilation perfusion lung scan, nuclear medicine, where you're you're looking at inhaled tagging of, of the air spaces, and then you're matching that with the perfusion of a short-acting isotope, and that should match like a hand in a glove, and there shouldn't be mismatched defects. Not everybody has the ability to do a really high-quality VQ scan. So we also have the SPEC CT where we use volumetric CT imaging to kind of look at a, a in a way that's a little bit better than planar imaging. So, but anyway, a VQ scan, if that's normal, if there's normal perfusion, they don't have this condition, you are done, you know. But if they do have mismatched defects, um, or maybe you've seen something chronic on a CT angio, then they, they can be referred and we'll take them to the cath lab, we'll do a right heart cath and we'll do a rotational pulmonary angiogram in the cath lab, which creates beautiful three-dimensional movies of the pulmonary vasculature that guide us in terms of like a Google map in terms of how to deal with things. So basically you should do a VQ scan, maybe a CT angio, and if they have trouble, we're happy to talk by phone or, or do e-consults or whatever it helps to get the patients here. And and if, if we review things ahead of time, we can create a personalized portfolio of assessment that will result in a few days here and, and we've got a careful diagnosis and a treatment plan. Sounds like a comprehensive uh, patient evaluation, uh, but start out with that VQ scan. Right. And that's normal. Start looking elsewhere. Exactly. All right, good. Um, so you mentioned the three therapies, the surgery, the catheter-based intervention, and then medication. Are there other things that are on the horizon or anything else we should be aware of, kind of keeping our eyes open for? Or is, are we in a really good spot right now? I think we're in a good spot. I think there's still patients with this syndrome that are being missed, you know? And so I think that if, if we can help them if we can find them. But if you have patients out there that are short of breath and they have particularly unexplained pulmonary hypertension, you should look for this condition because it's completely differently managed than just pulmonary arterial hypertension of other forms, right? So sure. we need these patients to be so actively sought out. And Part of this too, if you have somebody who's had a pulmonary embolus, a lot of them are going to fully recover, but not all of them. And so you should reassess those patients. And if they're still having shortness of breath six months later, you should really be looking for chronic thromboembolic pH. So I think a missing aspect still is, is that partnership with patients and providers who are out on the front line of finding these problems so that we can help these patients. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, because I remember at the very beginning of our discussion, you said two to eight percent of patients with a pulmonary embolism will not recover. So it's a small percentage, but still, if you think about how frequent pulmonary embolism, it's a huge number of patients. Exactly. And, you know, exactly. if I reflect upon my own practice and I have a subspecialty practice anyway, but I didn't, I don't think I'm picking up all the patients that I should be. So I'm going to take this uh, back to my general cardiology clinic and keep a very a high index of suspicion for this, especially in those patients. So this yeah. is great. Um, anything else you want to add to our discussion that you, you think the audience needs to hear? Or It's been a great I, discussion. I think it pretty well covers it, Kyle. It's just, I mean, again, it's a really neat field in terms of having these tools available that we can apply. So we're, we're happy to talk with patients and providers and try to help as many patients as we can with this condition. That's fantastic. Well, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to enlighten us about chronic uh, thrombo, about pulmonary hypertension and the treatments that are now not only available, but incredibly successful. Thanks so much for the opportunity, Kyle. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too. And thanks to all of our listeners. We'll look forward to our next episode of Interview with the Experts.